Welcome back to 6034 Fall 2020. Today is the eighth installment of recitation. We'll be talking about neural networks this time around. And today's goal is going to be to give you a intuitive understanding of what these models do. And I, I stress the intuition, the intuition component of it, because these are a very frequent topic and a very popular one at that. But often, we find that the intuition is missing and one gets bombarded with a lot of the math behind them. And here we seek to distill the math a little bit and then show you more or less what is going on with these models, how they work and how they learn. So let's jump right into it. Here's more or less the agenda. I'll go over the anatomy of neural networks, first giving you a little bit of the review of supervised machine learning that I touched upon in the previous recitation than the two ways of operating on neural networks, forward propagation and backward propagation. Obviously, I'll go into more detail when I get to those sections. Okay, so this is a recap of supervised machine learning from the last recitation. And the reminder, or the main concept that I want you to keep in mind is the particular goal of supervised machine learning, which is that you have a given set of data and the goal with that data is to come up with some sort of general rule. And that general rule is to classify correctly all the given data and all the given data points and new points. And what makes it this, what makes this supervised machine learning versus unsupervised machine learning is, and I'm going to write for each point in the data. So for each point, you have the following. For each point in the data, you have a list of features. They can look like x1, x2, so on and so forth, however many you want. And what makes this in particular supervised machine learning is that you also know a classification for each of these points. And you'll see you'll see how this classification in particular becomes very important in the case of neural networks. So the general flow of supervised machine learning is you have some vector, x, x vector being the vector of features, x1, x2, all the way through however many features you want, and then y being the classification again. You put it through some algorithm. And then you get out a rule for classifying some point x, uh, spoiler alert, some point x, and that point x has an unknown classification. And algorithms that you've seen so far, at least within the context of these recitations and 6034 at large, are Bayesian inference, the more, more specifically to, uh, would be naive Bayes was when we talked about features and the naive Bayes assumption being independence of features given the classification. So naive Bayes. And then the previous recitation, which was K nearest neighbors and ID trees. ID trees where you use the feature to, class, to separate the data into the most organized groups using a measure of entropy or, or disorder and KNNs being one where we, draw, we drew the boundaries for uh, KNNs with one year's neighbors and we hoped to classify the data as best as possible. So today, the focus is going to be on neural nets. Sometimes I find neural networks to be a mouthful or too much to write, so I might refer to them interchangeably as neural networks and neural nets. But know that I'm referring to the same thing. Okay, so here's a diagram of a relatively simple neural network. And I want to show you more or less where things go. 
So first off, we have the features that are going to be inputted. So imagine that I have, this is for one single point, x. Uh, let me add it in parentheses here. This is for one single point, x, which consists of three features, x1, x2, and x3. So these in blue are going to be the input nodes. which corresponds to the features of the point that I'm giving to it. And then each feature is going to be multiplied by some weight. You can imagine this in the context of, say, maybe a little bit related to ID trees where we can determine this feature is more important than this one. Well, in the case of a neural network, we would give a particular feature, say X2, for example, a higher weight. So just for the purposes of clarity, let me just label this weights. And then finally, we put it through, once each feature has a weight, we multiply all of them, we sum them. So here they are all summed. That is a very ugly sigma. We sum, and then finally, we apply some threshold onto that sum. And if that threshold is met, we output a one. If it's not met, we output a zero. And I'll go into more detail about what this threshold is and what we mean. In 6034, we're gonna be working with neural networks exclusively in the context of binary classification. And what that means is we're only going to be working with neural networks that output a zero or a one. Neural networks can get very complicated and very convoluted in having many, many different output layers, or not output layers, output nodes. So I could get one out node that outputs a one, one that outputs a zero. I could get them such that they all output a number between zero and one. So there are many ways in which this can become more complicated, but because we, I wanna focus on the essence of what neural networks do and what they are, we're gonna be focusing on the, simple, uh, the simpler binary classification example. And the last thing that I wanna note before I explain this threshold function is that these two are very, very commonly written together. and I'll explain shortly why. So let's talk about what exactly this threshold is. In our case, this straight edge, as in straight line, threshold is the stair step function. And the way it looks is the following. The function f of x is equal to 1 if x is greater than some threshold, greater than or equal to, and it's 0 if x is less than the threshold. On the graph on the right, it will look like this, which, as the name implies, is a stair step. Okay, so we have the stair step function. And what we're putting through the stair step function, that x that I've written there, is actually the sum of all the inputs or all the features in the previous slide. Oops. All the features here times all the weights, they're all summed, and that's the x that goes into here. Which means almost always, if not always, where this threshold is going to receive a sum of everything that came before it in a way which is why this is often written like this. The threshold function and the sum are often written as one single thing, or one thing, one single node, to use more precise language than thing. So to be yet more precise, this is the sum plus threshold function And this is what we refer to as a neuron or a node 
in the neural network, also abbreviated NN. Okay. So let's look at a grander or a more complicated neural network. Here I've made it simpler. Uh, simpler. I have a set of features. So this isn't, let me add this. This is a, the, that x1, x2, and x3. That's not a part of the neural network. It's simply imagine that I, that I have a point and this is what I'm going to give to the neural network. So it's going to be my input x. And then I have an input layer. The input layer typically is an identity function. What it means is it takes the, it's a set of nodes that take the input and basically reflect it or send it, pass it forward exactly how they received it. So they don't really change it. It's possible to change it in some ways. It obviously is dependent on the implementation. For the purposes of illustration, I made these connections simpler as in one node for one feature but there are ways in which one can play around with this. It doesn't affect the general behavior, and, and, and by that I mean it doesn't affect the concepts that we're teaching just for the purposes of simplicity. I've kept it one feature, one node in the input layer. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two. And then after the, the input layer nodes pass on that those features or the values with some associated weights, we get to the hidden layers. And if you're new to the neural networks, you may ask yourself, why the heck are they called hidden layers if I can see them on paper and they're not particularly hidden? Is they are hidden from the input and from the output. And let me add this final piece of information so that it makes sense. So the hidden layers are neither exposed to the input directly because there's a, an input layer between the input and the hidden layers. And they're not exposed to the output directly either because there's an output layer between the hidden layers and the output. So that's why, at least I remember them as hidden layers in particular because they're neither exposed directly to the input nor the output. They're exclusively hidden within the, the neural network. So now that we have the the neural net network anatomy down, let's work through a forward propagation example. And I'm going to, I'm not going to write very much or a set of instructions as I usually do, because forward propagation, I hope is a very intuitive process. And it looks like this. I have an, here's an input node with a value of one. It gives one to the weight. The weight is two. So I input, I multiply that feature or the, not that feature, the value of that node times the weight. So I get a value of two. Similarly for X2 here, that node outputs a value of three. The weight for the corresponding weight is two. So I multiply them. I get a value of six. At the bottom, I get negative one minus negative one. That's a one. And now the sum, I, this time I wrote it explicitly as sum and then threshold for the purposes of showing how the, the workflow is for forward propagation, but I'll abbreviate it to the node that includes both in later slides. So the sum sums everything as the name implies, and then the threshold is 12, which means the threshold is not met and this network outputs a value of zero. And that is forward propagation in it's more, it's more basic sense. Now let's do a single neuron example and not use values. So this node is going to output a value of X and this node is going to output a value of Y and the weight is A, the weight is B. So similar how, how I did in the previous slide, this would be XA, this would be, this would be YB, and then the threshold is going to be t, which means I'm going to get an output of one 
if and only if x a or more precisely a x plus b y is greater than or equal to t and zero if a x plus b y is less than t now I want you to look at this and think to yourself Doesn't this look familiar? Because it, maybe those of you who have a stronger mathematical or geometric background will quickly recognize it. For those of you who don't, obviously I'm going to explain what it is. And it's the equation of a line. I've drawn an arbitrary line. It doesn't necessarily mean that AX plus BY is always this line. I've just drawn the line. It's written there, but for the purposes of redundancy, ax plus by equal to t. That's the line I've drawn, for example. And that would that, that then begs the question, what does greater than or equal to t mean? And what that means is this area. That area is ax plus by is greater than or equal to t. Whoa. So I ha if I have a point whose features fall anywhere in this area, the neural network, or whose coordinates fall anywhere in this area, when I give it to the neural network, the neural network is going to output a value of 1. If it falls below this line, the neural network is going to output a value of 0. And conceptually, I hope it, the goal of this slide in particular is that it makes conceptual sense that the weights of a neural network and the features split the space into an area where the, the neural network outputs a 1 and the neural network outputs a 0. But I'm going to make it a, lo a lot more concrete in the following slide. And I'm going to do so using Boolean logic. Okay, so here I have an AND function, AND x and y. As you may recall, or from previous experience, an AND function only returns true or 1 when both x and y are true or 1. So I have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, and then 1, 1, 1, finally. So if I were to color these points on the right, according to what the classific what classification that would get, assuming the coordinates x and y are the truth values in the table, then this point, 1, 1 would be green. This one would be red. Red again. And 0, 0 would also be red. So if we're thinking of lines, how would you draw a line to separate the red points from the green points. So I'm going to draw one. And I'm going to draw it in the spirit of how we did with K and N's. Because um, I'll explain more what I mean with in the spirit of how I did with K and N's. Because I want to maximize the space in between the red points and the green points. Or the space between the red points and the blue line and the green points and the blue line. So I'm going to draw a line right here. It's not the straightest line in the world, but it is indeed a line. And then I'm going to say that the y-intercept is 0, 1.5. Because I believe in the, and what I meant now by in the spirit of K and N's is re recall from K nearest neighbors, we were drawing, we were connecting points of two different classes and then drawing a perpendicular bisector. And the perpendicular bisector, because it's at the middle of, it's at the midpoint of the line connecting points of two different classes, would have, would maximize the space between the midpoint and the point on the, on, of one class and the midpoint and the point of the other class. So that's more or less what we're trying to do here. I want 
the biggest possible margin between one class and the other class. So I've drawn my line. The, the y-intercept 0, 1.5 is the point that would maximize that margin. And I'm, going, I'm just going to write out the equation. So I think to myself, this area is, if a point falls in this area, then it should be a 1. And then if it falls below it, then it should be a 0 because below it would mean either x or y are zero. So y is greater than or equal to, the slope is negative because it's going down, so it's negative x. I'm gonna say it's negative one. The slope plus the y-intercept 1.5. Let me move around x. x plus y is greater than or equal to one. And obviously a, an and function is when we're working with zeros and ones, but if we're working with, let's say, continuous values, we're no longer working with zero and one, we can have 1.5, we can have 0 0.9, etc. And we're working with a neural network, we can translate this equation directly to a neural network. Like so, this would be one times x plus one times y is greater than or equal to 1.5. So I have a weight for x, one, I have a weight for y, and I have a threshold, 1.5. So this is a neural network that implements the AND function. And as a historical note, this type of neural network where I only have my input nodes, I have my inputs and I only, I essentially only have one node or a single layer neural network is referred to as the perceptron historically. I won't be using the term perceptron in 6034 in this recitation. We don't use it in 6034 in general, but I include the historical note for your own personal enrichment so we've implemented the AND function. I'm going to really quickly go through the OR function. It's exactly the same concept, but just so that you get used to the concept of dividing the space with a line and splitting it into areas. So the OR function, different from the AND function, states that if any one point of the ones given to it is a one, then it outputs a one, as evidenced by the truth table right here. Whenever either x or y or one or both, I get a one, which means these three, these three points are green. Then finally, oops, finally this last point zero zero is going to be red or zero. I'm gonna draw my line and it's gonna be exactly the same line except the y-intercept is going to be lower. And again, I'm applying the principle of maximizing the boundary between or the space between the points and the boundary. So exactly the same line except a bit lower. Y is greater than or equal to negative x plus 0 0.5 is my y-intercept now. And so now I have 1 times x plus 1 times y is greater than or equal to 0 0.5. So my threshold is now 0 0.5 and I have the same weights. So notice that in order to get, go from an AND function to an OR function in terms of Boolean logic, I only lower the threshold for activation. And by lowering the threshold then, that neural network is more often going to output a one. Now let's look at a NOT function. And this one theoretically should be simpler because it only takes, takes in one parameter. I, I have here not x, but because I'm working with two dimensions, I, I still include y along the table. And notice that not x is only going to be relative to x. It's independent of what y is. So in this case, when x is zero, not x is one, when x is one, 
not x is 0. So I go to my my list of points, or my my points on the right, and I highlight the ones that are true, and the ones that would get a 0 are red. And now, let me draw a line. So a straight line seems to be the most logical one here. And if I want to maximize, I would draw it at x equals 0 0.5. So let me work with this function, x equals, oops, x equals 0 0.5. Now let's start it a little bit. So what are we saying here? 1 times x plus 0 times y is equal to 0 0.5. And now let's think, is it greater than or less than? In reality, the points of interest to us are these. So it's whatever is behind that line. So it's a less than. x plus 0, y is less than 0 0.5, less than or equal to. But I'm not interested, as in the stair-step function outputs, or the way we've defined it in this recitation, is for greater than or equal to some number, not less than or equal to. So I'm going to multiply the entire equation by negative 1, negative 1 times x plus 0 times y, is going to be greater than or equal to negative 0 0.5. And because I've multiplied both sides of the equation, it still holds true. And now I have, I have it in a format that works with the threshold function. I have a weight of negative 1 for x, 0 for y, and the threshold is now negative 0 0.5. And notice the same way I pointed out in the truth, in the, in the truth table that why that whatever y is does not affect the final outcome the same way it's been shown in this single neuron neural network where the weight of y is zero which means there is zero input from this feature to the final sum x controls the entirety of what goes into the threshold into determining whether it up the node outputs one or zero and now let's go into a very important example for neural networks. <clears throat> and I say very important example in many ways, especially historic example. And I'll go into this as soon as you see what I mean about why this is important. So this is an XOR function. What it says is it's an exclusive OR. What that means is either X is true or Y is true but not both. And the way it looks is whenever x is 0, y is 0, I also get a 0. Whenever x is 0, y is, y is 1, so either x or y, then I get a 1. When x is 1, y is 0, I also get a 1, but then when they are both true, I get a 0. And let's highlight or color the points on this graph to see more or less how it looks. And this really quickly brings about a problem. How do I draw a line, a single line, that would separate these two in a, or the green points from the red points successfully without mixing green or red? Thinking back to the AND example, I could try the line I used for the AND or I could try the line I use for the or example. But in reality, all sign all signs point to not there to there being no one line, no single line that can split the two. So let me just label these quickly. This is the boundary from the or. 
and this is the boundary from the end. Needless to say, the, the boundary from the not example wouldn't work. So it seems here that I need two lines. And the reason this example is so important is this, uh, this XOR example was used to prove that perceptrons, the single node, neural the single layer neural networks that I mentioned earlier, would never be able to, uh, to solve problems that cannot be separated by a single line. So that uh, problems that can be solved using a single line by splitting into two halves are referred to as linearly separable. I I, I print parenthesis. This is outside. Of, this historical note is outside of the point. The not the point. The context of six zero three four. But I think it's important to, to uh, for many reasons to know this. Close parenthesis. So, this was Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert, I believe. They published a book called um, called Perceptron, if I'm not mistaken. And don't quote me on that. And they showed that the XOR problem could not be solved by a single layer neural network or a perceptron. And this led, this was in the 80s, this led neural network research to essentially be brought to a halt until more or less 2010 when uh, Jeffrey Hinton and a few others won a competition for image classification using a neural network. And I, I bring this up because the main innovation that, that brought about the success and that brought about the popularity, popularity of neural networks, at least at the time of recording, is that neural networks, when people in the 80s knew that they could be stacked, but there was no proof that they would reach the best possible solution by stacking them and they were computationally very very expensive so once you here i have one neural network or one layer if i make five layers then in order to train them as you'll see in the back propagation example it becomes very difficult especially and for us and then obviously the computer might be able to automate it a lot faster but it gets to a point that it takes too much time to train them so the main innovation of 2010 and 2020 now is that we have a lot more computational resource, uh, resources. So we are now able to use these more uh, with the computational resources that we have versus what was available in the 80s. So that's the end of the historical note. Let me show you then how to build a neural network that can solve this XOR problem. And as I alluded to in the historical note, we can stack them. So we know how to draw a neural network for an AND, and we know how to draw a neural network or how to build a neural network for an OR. So let's do that first. Let's start with the OR. Recall that the OR was 1 times x plus 1 times y is greater than or equal to 0 0.5. So this is 1, 1, 0 0.5. This is the OR. And then the AND in the example that we did was this area was green because we were interested in AND. But now we want whatever is under the AND. So let's start with by flipping the inequality. So it would be 1 times x plus 1 times y is less than or equal to 1.5 because I'm interested in what's under. But I'm dealing with thresholds, so I need to flip the inequality by multiplying by negative 1 on both sides. So this is negative 1 times x plus negative 1 times y is greater than or equal to negative 1.5. So I have a new threshold, negative 1.5 and new weights. That's almost unreadable. Yeah, negative 1. Negative one. Then finally, I need some logic that will take 
whatever is green for the top line and whatever is green for the bottom line and it's going to use that and only that which means I need an and and what it's saying is it's above the bottom line and below the top line and we already know how to make an and that we get assign a weight of one and one and a threshold of 1.5 and this is enough to make a perform an and function on the two single layer neural networks right here so this is a two layer neural network we have the, uh, the first layer here and the second layer here now let's try it and see whether it works here I have the point 0101 and I'm just going to go very quickly through it this is a 0 this is a negative 1 the threshold is 1.5 which means I get a 1 because negative 1 is greater than negative 1.5 then I have a 0 and a 1 the threshold is 0 0.5 so I get a 1 get a 1 by multiplying by the weights and 2 is greater than 1.5 so I get a 1 and I would get exactly the same result for x equals 1 y equals 0 because I have the same weights I have the same weight here and here here and here so I could just put 1 here 0 here 1 here 0 here and I would get the same result so let's test it for a 1 1 1 1 here it's negative 1 negative 1 whoops I got it ahead of myself this is a 1 and 1 so I get a 1 here because 2 is greater than 0 0.5 and I get a 1 here but negative 2 is less than negative 1.5 so I get a 0 I get a 0 and the threshold is actually not met so this at the end is 0 so we know that all ones both x and y being true is not met by the XOR, uh, XOR function or is uh, XOR would return false and this neural network returns uh, zero or false. So in that case, we are covered. And then finally for the zeros, we have a zero and a zero, and that's greater than negative 1.5. So I get a one and then a one, but then I have zero and zero, and that does not meet the threshold. So it's a zero, zero, and 1.5 is greater than one, which is the input. So I get a zero again. So we know this XOR function works according to the specifications of our truth table. And this leaves something to be said about neural networks and this is revisiting the diagram from the beginning of the recitation. So what is happening or what, it, what is happening in the XOR function and this is actually a very general point what typically happens with these feed forward neural networks and by feed forward I mean that there's a, a bunch of a uh, layer of nodes 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 and the information flows forward so feed forward as the name implies let me just quickly recap this is the input it's not a part of the neural network then the, these input nodes in the input layer each of them each neuron or each node draws a line. So as you saw in the XOR example, the this top node in the input layer, this top node drew the top line, this no node do, drew the bottom line, and what happens with the remaining layers is that they combine line shadings or line areas with different logic functions. For a second I thought the, the stylus had run out of battery. I'll quickly erase erase this. Okay. 
that's an ugly bit of text. What I mean by that is, going back to the XOR example, these two nodes drew a line each. This layer then took those two lines, took the area in between them and applied the AND function. And that's what we mean by combine line shadings with different logic functions because they perform Boolean logic to some extent or in some way with the areas above or below the lines that were drawn in the input layer. And with that, I'm going to close up forward propagation and I'm going to move into back propagation. So after I perform forward propagation, there I get a, a network output. And let's say you didn't uh, st uh, give the neural network the weights that would give it the right answer. So it outputs some number, some one or zero, and you were expecting if something else. You were expecting a zero and it got and you got a one, or you were expecting a one and you got a zero. So now you have to once you get that output, you have to calculate some error signal. And obviously, we'll go into detail about what that what constitutes that error signal. And you want to use that error signal to once you have that error signal, you send it through the network in reverse. That's why it's uh, we call this back propagation, in order to update the weights. And so the weights are changed in the direction in in a way that you move closer. The network moves closer to outputting the answer that you want or that I want. So and you would ask why do this instead of doing what we did where we drew a line we wrote the equation of the line and then we set the networks the weights of the network manually and it's because imagine yourself drawing a line or drawing lines when you get a i can't get it right when you get a space that looks like this where red and blue are the two different classifications. And it's very often the case that we are applying these neural networks to, uh, to problems or to spaces where the data is in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of data points. And personally, I can't imagine myself drawing lines through millions of points uh, and they often don't separate as cleanly as the Boolean logic functions which is why we rely on this back propagation method to have the neural network take care of that complexity for us. So here's a general information flow diagram of what is going on with the neural network. So I have some input data and I feed it into the neural network and then the neural network produces some output and I have some notion of a desired output as well because this is data that I have available to me, I know its features and I know its classification. And I'm going to say that the, the desired output is out star in the later equations that we'll be using. And then I use both the desired output and the output of the neural network to calculate this error signal. And the error signal I send in directly to the neural network. So this part here is what we refer to as the beginning, or at the beginning of recitation as forward propagation. And then this part where the error signal is calculated and given back to the neural network is back propagation. And what happens is in back propagation, you want to change the weights slightly to move the neural network closer to outputting the right answer or the answer that you want. But then there's also one more thing that you need to change. And those are the thresholds because maybe you have it, the neural network is performing an and function and you want it to perform an or function or you want it to slightly increase the threshold, lower the threshold, excuse me. So in reality, you're playing with two things at the same time, thresholds and weights. And that can be actually, it can get very complicated 
to try to optimize for both things at the same time. But what if you could turn the threshold into a weight itself and then you don't have to worry about thresholds, you only worry about weights. And that's actually what we refer to as the threshold trick. What the threshold trick says is, recall this is the and example. I have x with a weight of one, y with a weight of one, and the threshold of 1.5. And I don't wanna to have to deal with this threshold and I would rather deal with weights because then every, every parameter that I'm tuning within the network is a weight and not dealing with a mix of thresholds and weights. So what I want is a threshold of zero and all my threshold, thresholds are then going to be zero because that's easier to deal with. And then I want to make my threshold a weight in the, uh, an input into the function with a weight. So I've effectively added an extra node to the neural network that is going to essentially center the threshold onto zero. So what is happening is the following. At the bottom left, you have the threshold function, the way we defined it at the beginning of recitation. But then once we apply the threshold trick, because we are subtracting 1.5 by having a negative weight and that node outputting 1.5, then the following happens. It is centered at zero. And obviously the weight, changing the weight can change the offset or can change the threshold. So now the threshold is a part of the weights and the parameters and can be tuned via backpropagation as well. Now, the next thing is, first, let me preface this. When we're calculating the error signal, we need some notion of how to change the weights. And that notion we get by performing a derivative operation on some error, error function. And that'll tell us more or less how to change the weights. The problem is, the following. If we're using the stair step function, and this is without the threshold trick, because it's independent of the threshold trick. If we're using the stair step function, look at these two points. If I were to perform a derivative, I would fail because these two corners of, of the threshold function are not differentiable. That is a very poorly written word so I had to drop the caps it's this per, uh, this threshold stair step function is not differentiable at the corners so this is going to make it extremely hard to calculate the error signal to give back to the network and one way to handle this is by smoothing the corners. And there is actually a function that smoothens the corner, the corners of the stair step function, and that is the sigmoid function. The sigmoid function, before writing it out explicitly, looks like this. So it's not exactly a hard threshold but it doesn't have the corners that this one has. So it is differentiable, which means I won't have any problems calculating an error signal using the sigmoid. And even more so, it has parameters that can help me tune it a little bit more. So let me make this a little bit more concrete. Sigmoid. S and M of X, and frequently I'll write it as the Greek letter sigmoid of X is equal to one over 
one plus e to the minus s times x plus m. And so you, you might be asking what this s and what this m are. S is the steepness of the sigmoid, and then m is the midpoint. So the sigmoid, as I've drawn it, is centered at m. I'm not an artist, so not exactly. And then the steepness is cons uh, is controlled by that s. So if I were to increase the steepness, I would get a sigmoid that looks like that. If I reduced the steepness, I would get a sigmoid that looks like this. So I can make it look like the hard threshold, the hard stair step function a lot more and still have it be differentiable. So now that we know that, let's talk about the error signal that we want to calculate. And what I will be using in this recitation, what we use in 6034, is the mean squared error. The mean squared error is a measure of how wrong, or on average, how wrong our neural network is. In our case, because we're only dealing with binary classification, it's a relatively constrained range of values. But, and I'll show you because uh, by writing the equation. It's negative one half out star minus out squared. So because out star and out are either zero or one, the, great, the largest value that I can get is negative one half, I believe. Yeah, because it would be one, it would be either one minus zero or zero minus one squared is one, then negative times negative one half, then I would have an error of negative one half for a particular point. But then if I do it over all the points, then I get some sort of average of errors. So to be more precise, it's not exactly mean squared error because I'm not taking the mean over all points in the way I've written it here. It's the mean squared error of a part it's the error the squared error of a particular point but it's referred to but this equation is used often in in the mean squared error in other contexts so i'm going to keep referring to it as mean squared error so this is going to be the desired output out star and this is going to be the neural network output And because it's a negative, and because it's a squared function, assuming that out star and out could take values other than zero and one, I would have the following inverted parabola, or quadra inverted quadratic under out star. So at this graph, to elaborate a little bit, I've taken out star and I fixed it. I know that out star is, for example, one. And I, I want to calculate the mean squared error relative to that out star as I change the different outputs of the neural network. So this is a changing output of the neural network with respect to one particular desired output. And then my goal with this neural network is to get to have the neural network output be as close to zero as possible. Right, so I want to get to this out star point because that would mean I have very, very little error in the neural network, which would translate to very good accuracy when, when performing binary classification. So let's look now at the weights in particular. In the previous graph, we were looking at the output of the network. 
now I want to look at the error. So this should be assume this is a function this outputs the error as a function of all the weights of the neural network and I've graphed it against w1 so I, this is a graph of how the error of the neural network changes as I change w1 and suppose my current starting value of w1 is this one this point right here and it's w11 let me quickly note that this is um, error as a function of w1. So how do I make the performance of the network improve? So those of you who are more attuned to or have a fresher calculus background know that we can analyze the slope of the line at w11 to know whether I want to increase or decrease the weights. And this is more or less how it would look. So I've, let's suppose I calculated the derivative of the error function with respect to w1. And I have this slope right here. So I would know that now that I have the slope, I know that I have to go in this direction in order to get better performance or better results. So after analyzing the slope, I would be here. This would be my new value for w11. And because it's the second value, I'm going to say this is w12, second value. But then you ask yourself, or we ask ourselves, we know the direction, but how did you know how far to go? So how did I end up here and not here or here? And that's given to me by r. r is going to be my learning rate and that's going to tell me how big a step to go in one direction or another. So to formalize this a little bit, the slope is going to be given to me by the derivative of the mean squared error and then the step size r and it's also referred to as the rate constant, but I'll refer to it as the step size. This is either given to me or I find it in training. And then what do I mean by finding it in training? It means, let's suppose I have a neural network and I train it with one value of r say 0 0.01, and then I train it with a value of R of 0 0.05, and I get, for example, 5% more performance. Then I know, then I would use a 0 0.05 because I just got better performance. But then let's say I try a very small value of R and I get even more performance, then I use that one. That's what I mean by optimized or found in training. You simply use, you find a value of R that works well and you stick with it. Or you just take a standard value of R, I believe, a standard R is 0 0.01 in feedforward neural networks. So as you're trying to find some value of R in your training, you might think, oh, so if I lower the value, it's a very fine grained search. So a lower value of R is, is good. But then you might run into the, va the problem that R is too small. And then what happens is you may get stuck in a local maximum.
what this means is so you move your r is very small so you move let's say one step is this is w12 or 21 w31 w41 w51 and then the slope here is zero because you're at the top of a hill so because your r is so small you're going to stay here and notice that this isn't exactly zero. The error, uh, if this is error, then this isn't exactly zero. It's a little bit, there's some error. But there is a point somewhere else where the error is zero. And you'll never be able to find it because the, your R was so small that you got stuck here instead of finding this better place here. And so the natural reaction to that is, okay, so I just increase my R to make sure I find this place and because this is a little bit this curve is far from this one I need to make R very large and then you run into the following problem that R is too big and what that what the problem with that is that then it becomes hard to find the right W the right set of weights because the learning is volatile. And what I mean by this is, let's say you make R relatively large. So you move from here, your slope tells you to go up, but R is fairly large, so you go past here and you end up here. And then the, the slope tells you to go up again, but R makes you past, uh, past the slope and you end up here. And then you do the calculation again, and R makes you fall here, and then you end up somewhere here. So you're, you're, you end up bouncing around this, all the curves without landing on a single place that would be good. And that's what I mean by making it hard to find the right weight because the slope, the, you're going through many different slopes with one single jump of R. And it, it really makes the problem a lot harder. So in, in reality, finding that rate constant or the learning rate is a balancing act in many ways and there's no single defined way to calculate a, a the optimal value of r it's many ways done empirically via testing so you tested one value and it was okay and then you tested another one and it was better so you use the better one okay so back to back propagation the graph that i was showing showed the, the error as a function of one weight. But we don't really want the error as a function of one weight. We want the error as a function of all the weights. Because when you have the error as a function of all the weights, then you know how to tweak each individual weight with a gradient calculation. Because this is no longer a derivative. When we go multidimensional and we're working with surfaces, then it's a gradient. And I've chosen to make it simpler here by choosing only two weights and then the mean squared error as a function of those two weights to make it a three-dimensional surface. And let's say this, the error, the error surface has the following shape. So this is a hill. And even though I have the arrows at the bottom, remember that mean squared error is negative. So let's say that the zero point is over here. Let's say this is, this is the origin. So we're trying to get as close, we wanna get as close to the origin as possible. And my weights W2 and W1 land me here. So as I mentioned, because we're now dealing with a surface instead of a single, a single curve, we want to use the gradient of the surface to change W1 and W2 such that we reach the top of the hill.
And as a reminder that when we reach the top of the hill, that's when the, or if, if that's the, the optimum, the highest hill that there is, then that's when the error is at its smallest. As in the, the network perform, the network has commits the least amount of errors. And this is what we call gradient descent or gradient ascent. In our case, because of the way that I've defined the mean squared error, we're going up a hill, so this would be gradient descent. Often, the problem is defined in such a way that we're going down and we want to find the bottom. So that would be gradient descent. There are equivalent ways of expressing this problem, as long as you consist, you're consistent throughout the definition and then solving for the, for the equations. So let's do a very simple example. So here, excuse me, I have a very simple neural network. I have an input node, I have a weight B, and I have an output node. And I want to show you more or less the equations of how this would look. So let's say I want to change the weight B, or better said, weight a, B, because it goes from node A to node B. So the first equation that you need to keep in mind is that the new weight, I'm not going to use A, B in this case because there's only one weight, is equal to the old value of it plus a delta. So this is the change that we want in the weight to make the network work better. And so you need to calculate that delta. So you need, you want to change it by the value, the, you want to take, we multiply it by r because that's the step that we want to take. Then we multiply it by the output of a and by delta b. And delta b then is going to be the slope of more or less uh, in a, conceptually it's going to be the slope of of the error at the point in which we are so if we if i got so this outputs this is going to be out b and let's say that's the output of the network then I want to calculate the derivative at that point, as in at that error, and that's going to tell me in which direction I need to go with respect to the weights. And I'll, I'll keep writing the equations now. So keep in mind that del this delta B is a property of neuron B. So if B is in the final layer, this means that this out B is the output of the network and I can directly calculate the mean squared error using that out B because it would be out star minus out B. Then I want to take the derivative of the mean squared error, negative one half out star minus out B squared and I'm going to get the following. This is the derivative of the mean squared error. But this is, I wanted to take the derivative with respect to the output of, <clears throat> of this neuron. So I need to go further and I need to take the derivative of the sigmoid function that created, that caused the output B. And when I take the derivative of the sigmoid, I get the following. And that is going to be delta B if and only if B is the output or in the output layer. But if B is not in the output layer, 
then delta b is going to be, again, it's going to be the derivative of the sigmoid function. But this time, it's going to be multiplied by <clears throat> the corresponding derivatives, or let me finish writing the sum, outgoing ci. So out b and multiplied by the sum of each of the connection, each of the outgoing connections of that node b and the corresponding deltas of those neurons. So b, the weight that connects b to the neuron ci and the delta ci. So because the neuron B is not at the output layer anymore, we need, to, we need to go further to the output to calculate the slope and see how that slope tells us to, ma to change slightly the neurons in the first layers, in the, in the, um, <clears throat> in the first layers. So that's roughly a summary of the equations that we will be using and I want to give you an example of how we apply them. There's, there's a lot of math and calculus that goes into deriving each of these equations. I glossed over them because no, this is an application of, this is an, a sophisticated application of the chain rule in calculus, the derivative chain rule. And you can try this exercise on your own, but I would spend, uh, it would, if I were to derive the chain rule now, it would become a whole lecture in itself. So I'm, uh, so the consensus, not the consensus, the compromise is to give you the equations and tell you more or less where they, they originated from. So let's do one example. So you have the following neural network and your goal or the task is to classify with this neural network people as either humans or terminators. And you have each person has three features, whether that person misuses common phrases, has super strength, and is good with guns. And I've given you, I've given you here one person already, Arnold. Arnold has super strength, does not misuse phrases, and is good with, gun, good with guns. And you have, you run it through the network, you run Arnold through the network and you get some output Z. I'm not going to say whether it's true or whether it's one or zero. I'm just going to leave it as Z. And I'm going to tell you the desired output is zero. We really want Arnold not to be a terminator. And then we finally, we have step size is 10. Note that for the purposes of the exercise, I'm telling you that the output of this node P is out P is n. Your task is going to be derive the equation that would update w1. Essentially write out this w, w1 new equals w1 old plus this delta w1 and that would be the equation to update this weight such that we get the desired output and I'm going to work through it with you. Let's see. I have the equations from the previous slide here on display and we're going to work through them. <clears throat> so the first thing to write is w1 nu is equal to w1 old that's not compact. Plus delta w1. And now I need to calculate this, this term, or find the equation for that term. So delta w1 is equal to the step size, how far to go, times the output of the network of the node right before it, out s.
and then times delta p. Because that is the that is the delta of the neuron to which it goes. And now we have a case where delta p is not in the output layer, different to how it happened in the very simple uh, network at the beginning where it had a weight, b, this is output. So now it gets a little bit more complicated, but thankfully it's only connected to one other neuron, so it's not, it doesn't get too hard. So delta p is equal to the derivative of the sigmoid that causes its output. So that I know it's it, out p is equal to n. So this is n times 1 minus n. I'm going to plug in the values or use out p first to be a little bit more explicit. Out p times 1 minus out p. Then I need to multiply it by the sum of all of its outgoing values or outgoing variables, out, all of the nodes to which it go, uh, to which it connects later. So think of it as in which direction is out p going? To which nodes is out p going? And it's only out p only goes to one node, which is a uh, node u. So this is going to be w five times node u. And for example, if it connected to some other node s, for example, then it will look like this w7 times delta s. But that's not the case. So thankfully, our computations are a bit simpler. Then finally, I need to calculate delta u. Delta u is in the output layer. So I use the output of the network, which is the output of delta u, to calculate the derivative of the mean squared error. This is out star minus out u, which is z. Then I have the derivative of the sigmoid out u, 1 minus out u. Then if I plug and chug a little bit, this becomes out star minus z. This is z, 1 minus z. Then this becomes <coughs> n, 1 minus n, w5 times this. And then this becomes 10 times out s plus all of this. Roughly summarized, here is the whole written out equation. And you can see how in backward propagation, the signal really does go from, from I would say, end to start, from output to input, better said. Because I need to calculate some error at the very beginning. This is the start of my error signal. And that tells me the slope to change that first set of weights. But then I use that slope of the first set of weights to change the layer behind it and then the layer behind it. So I really, really am going backward in these computations because I, I keep computing derivatives in the earlier layers using the derivatives in the, in the later layers. And so to give you a rough summary of how neural network training as a whole goes, it's the following. You first perform forward propagation, to the, you give the network an input, you get some output, and then after that, you compare your desired output with the output from the neural network and you use it to perform gradient descent, which is you calculate the deltas for the final layers and then 
you take you use those deltas to calculate the deltas for the the earlier layers and once you have those you can use them to calculate to finally calculate the delta w so how much are you going to change each w and or each weight to be more the delta weights and then change each weight and then you update all the weights and then you can repeat that with either the same point or other points and that as a summary I, I think is a good recap of neural networks in general today you saw gradient descent and you saw <clears throat> their limitations and how they can they were extended you adding additional layers and I hope that this recitation gave you a basic intuition of how they work how they perform logic and I hope that uh, you this uh, this recitation also gave you tools to practice this on your own I highly encourage you to practice back propagation in particular on your own and writing out the equation the the update equations for weights explicitly for example you can refer to the very last example and calculate the update equation for say w4 or w3 and I think that would be very good practice to make sure that you understand the equations what they mean how to use them when it's in the final layer when it's not in the final layer and have a really good understanding of the chain rule or not the chain rule because I didn't drive it explicitly but how these weight update equations work and how back propagation and forward propagation work so I hope this was a good intuitive explanation of neural networks and I'll see you on the next one